Yellowstone National Park. For many people, it is a wonderland filled with all the awe and power of nature. It is a pristine setting in the midst of the 21st century. Each year, more than three million people from around the world visit Yellowstone. They come to see the most famous geyser in the world. They come to see the wild animals in their natural habitat. They come to see the masterpieces of nature's paintbrush. There are hundreds, thousands of wonders here, really world-class wonders. It's been two centuries since that first Euro-American walked through this awe-inspiring land. Seventy of those 200 years were used exploring and establishing it as a national park. The remaining years have been spent trying to balance nature with park visitors. It's a process that's still being learned. It's pretty good today, but in my opinion, it needs to be even better. The early white men who visited the area gave descriptions of boiling mud. spouting water. To their mostly illiterate counterparts of the early 1800s, the stories were beyond the scope of imagination. The tales were routinely filed in the category of fictional entertainment. John Coulter was the first of these Euro-Americans to bring back reports of the thermal areas. His listeners thought they were hearing the ravings of a deranged man. They laughed and scoffed at his descriptions, labeling the area Coulter's Hell. Our narrative begins with Coulter's discovery, the first of many, which led to the preservation of the wonderland we now call Yellowstone. The story starts near present-day Bismarck, North Dakota. The year was 1806. Lewis and Clark were returning from their exploration of the Oregon country. He recounted to a skeptical audience the facts of his adventures. He told of water spout. Steam screaming out of the ground. Beautiful pools of hot water and boiling mud. You know, nobody wanted to believe him. I mean, it was it was an incredible story. Uh, so it became known as Coulter's Hell. The gold strikes in Idaho and Montana brought a population base close to the region. They established towns and cities. Uh, during the 1860s, gold strikes were made in Montana territory, uh, notably at Alder Gulch and uh, uh, up by Missoula. Several mining groups shoveled and panned their way through Yellowstone 
looking for that elusive end of the rainbow. We do know he traveled along the western shores of Yellowstone Lake and then followed along the Yellowstone River. He was probably the first Euro-American to also see scenes like these. It was the season of short days and cold, long nights. They visited the Lower Geyser Basin once again, where the year before he had witnessed and recorded two geysers, Daisy and the Grand. Soon after reaching camp, a tremendous rumbling was heard shaking the ground in every direction. And soon a column of steam burst forth from a crater near the edge of the east side of the river. Following the steam arose by a succession of impulses a column of water apparently six feet in diameter to a height of 200 feet while the steam ascended a thousand feet or more. We called this the Grand Geyser, for its power seemed greater than any other of which we obtained any knowledge in the valley. Dr. Hayden's party, along with a protective cavalry escort, left Fort Ellis, Montana Territory on July 12, 1871. Dr. Hayden brought along the park's first photographer, William Henry Jackson. Jackson was the first to take pictures of what would become some of the most photographed scenes in the world. It was his pictures that showed the wonders of Yellowstone to a skeptical world. made by folks who came on a horse with a pack string. They were mounted. In 1877, that Wild West flavor became a little too strong. Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce Indians traveled through the park. They were fleeing to Canada with the U.S. cavalry hot on their heels. The Indians attacked and killed some tourists that had the misfortune of visiting Yellowstone at the wrong time. Eighteen seventy seven was important in another aspect of Yellowstone's history. With the army came the manpower and authority to regulate the park. A guy by the name of Red Siwash opened a saloon out in the far reaches of Lamar Valley near a place called Round Prairie. The army had no use for him and they just tossed him out in his ear. He didn't have his permits and they dismissed him. And under its control, the park hotels, transportation, and visitation rights were established. And so, almost 80 years after its first discovery, the foundation of the modern park was finally in place. Conditions to make it safe and practical for people from around the world to see John Coulter's mysterious bubbling waters. 